Today, I'm gonna to share three stories that scared me. But before we get into those stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three or four times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please kidnap the like button, tie them up, and then forcibly brush their teeth and then make them drink orange juice afterwards. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. In 2010, Kayla was a senior at the University of California, Santa Barbara, a big party school. And one Friday evening, Kayla and her friends were at a big party, and Kayla was having a great time, but she was starting to feel really tired. And so she asked her friends if maybe they wanted to leave early, but none of them did. And so Kayla left on her own. Luckily, her house was just down the road, and so she was at her front door in a matter of minutes. That night, her two roommates, who were also college seniors, had decided to stay in and just have a nice night with a couple of friends having some wine. And so when Kayla walked inside, she happened to turn to the right and she looked on the closest wall where there was a sofa and she saw there was a guy laying there with a blanket up to his chin and his eyes were wide open. She didn't recognize him, but he was staring at her and she figured, oh, he must be a friend of her roommates. But as she walked across the room, she kind of glanced back at him and he had pulled the covers down slightly and he had lifted his head up and he was staring at her kind of menacingly. And so Kayla got a really bad vibe from this guy and just kind of hustled into her room, shut the door behind her and locked it, something she never did. And a few minutes later, she was in her bed and she was passed out. A couple of hours later, she woke up to what sounded like tapping on wood. And so she sat up in her bed and she's kind of looking around. She had a couple drinks the night before and she's half asleep, so she's a bit disoriented. But finally, when she gets her bearings, she realizes this tapping sound is the sound of someone drumming their fingers on the outside of her door. And so she's looking at her door, wondering who would be doing that. And then all of a sudden the drumming stops and it's replaced by the sound of this person scratching on the outside of the door. And so now Kayla's thinking, okay, you know, is this guy who was out on that couch, is he, is he playing a joke on me? And so she's sitting there wondering if she should just go over there and open the door and tell him to stop. But before she gets out of her bed, the scratching gets louder and louder and louder until it's so loud that it's kind of menacing. And so Kayla decides she's not gonna go out there. And so instead she pulls out her phone and she texts her roommate and says, hey, can you please come out in the living room and take care of your friend who's harassing me? But she doesn't get a response from that roommate and the scratching is just still loud as ever. And so she texts her other roommate the same message, come out and take care of your buddy here. But again, she doesn't get a response. And now the scratching on the door has stopped and it's been replaced by jiggling of her doorknob. And so now Kayla is just mad because this is obviously a prank and it's a dumb prank. And so she yells out, hey, stop, but it doesn't do anything. And so now Kayla's like, okay, I gotta call my roommates, wake them up, they'll come out and they'll handle it. And so she calls one of her roommates and they do pick up this time. And Kayla angrily tells them, hey, come out into the living room and tell your friend to knock it off. He's totally harassing me. And her roommate was confused. She's trying to make sense of what Kayla's saying. And she says, Kayla, you know, what are you talking about? What friend are you talking about? And Kayla says, the guy sleeping on the couch, the guy in our living room sleeping on the couch. And her roommate said, Kayla, we didn't have anybody over last night. Is somebody out there? You need to call the police. Kayla's adrenaline surged and she very calmly told her roommate, lock your door immediately. And right then she noticed the jiggling of her doorknob and the scratching and it all stopped. And Kayla's wondering, you know, where did this guy go? And then after a couple of seconds, she heard extremely loud banging coming from across the house where her two roommates shared a room. And it was the sound of this guy trying to smash down their door. And so Kayla's screaming, her roommates are screaming. Kayla manages to dial up 911. And before long, there are sirens outside. And Kayla hears the sound of this guy run across the house and she hears the sliding door open and shut. The police come inside, they search the property, and there's no sign of this guy, and so Kayla and the roommates come outside, they talk to the police, and the police bring them over to their side door, and they show them on the outside, there was all sorts of scratch marks all over the doorknob and right around the latch, and they said it looks like he was able to jimmy his way into your house through this door. And so then they asked the girls to give their statement about what happened, and they started with Kayla. They went over to her bedroom door so she could demonstrate what happened, and that's when they noticed there were all these scratch marks and gouge marks all over the outside of her bedroom door, and all over the doorknob, and all over the latch. 
and on the ground was a pair of scissors and a knife. And the police told Kayla that it looks like he used those scissors and that knife to open up the side door, and he was trying to use those tools again to open up her door, but for whatever reason, he just couldn't do it. They told Kayla that most likely when she went in the front door, she caught this guy off guard. Maybe he was trying to rob the place, maybe he had just broken in, but either way, Kayla got in and ruined his plans. And so he leapt onto that sofa, the one against that inner wall, to kind of tuck himself away in hopes that maybe Kayla wouldn't look over and see him. And they told her that most likely when she made eye contact with him, she became a witness and therefore a target of opportunity. And had she not locked her door, who knows what would have happened. In 2004, 16-year-old Misty Tasker was a typical American teenager living in Live Oak, Florida, which is a small rural town right in the middle of the state. One Saturday evening in January, she and her mother attended a church service. Afterwards, they hopped in her mother's truck and they got on the country highway and began making their way home. Their house was just 20 minutes down this highway. It was a straight shot. And this highway was pretty desolate. There were no street lights. It was actually a dirt road despite being a highway. And it was just thick forest on both sides of the road the entire way. There were no buildings or houses between the church and their neighborhood. Misty's mother was already a very anxious driver who would keep both hands on the wheel. She would sit up and kind of hunch over the wheel and keep her eyes in intently focused on the road, but at night her driving anxiety would shoot through the roof because she had really bad eyesight. And so she would go to great lengths to not drive at night to avoid that high level of anxiety. But the church service they had just come from had run a little bit long, and so now Misty's mother is driving with the sun starting to set, and she's going as fast as she can to try to get home before it gets too dark. And so as they're bombing down this road at about 55 miles an hour, despite it being about a 40 mile per hour zone, Misty, who's in the passenger seat just happens to look over at her mother for no particular reason and as she's looking at her she notices out her mother's window it looks like there's a little girl sitting on the side of the road what's a child doing out here in the middle of nowhere she says to her mom i think i just saw a little girl and misty's mother who's high up on the wheel she did not hear misty the first time she's just focused on driving and trying to get home and so Misty says again, I think I just saw a little girl. We need to go back. I don't know what she's doing, but I feel like we need to go back and make sure she's okay. And so Misty's mom looks over at her and she's not prepared to turn the car around. That means staying out later and it means she's going to be driving in even darker conditions. And so she's like, did you really see someone? Because we got to get home. And Misty's like, mom, I'm pretty sure I saw a little girl. We have to go back. And so finally, Misty's mother, she's very annoyed, but she stops the car, she does a three-point turn, and she begins driving back up the road where they came from towards this girl. Now, they had only made it about a half mile from where Misty believed she had seen this girl. And so pretty quickly, they slowed down because Misty said, I think she's in this area, and they both began scanning the right side of the road because that's where she's gonna be now that they've turned around. Now, it was starting to get very dark outside, but there was enough light and they had headlights. They were pretty confident they'd be able to spot this girl. And so as they're slow rolling down the road, they both see this girl a little ways up on the right-hand side. Her back was to the road. She had her knees tucked up to her chest and she was rocking back and forth. Misty's mother made a comment that it was a little bit surprising that this girl was out here. I mean, there's really nothing around here. There's no houses, there's no buildings, there's no trails to be walking in in this forest on either side. It was just kind of thick forest. And so she just thought it was very strange that this girl would even be out here, especially because there's not any traffic on this road. And so Misty's mother began slowly rolling up to her and she told her daughter that instead of just stopping right away, let's just drive past her and get a look at her. And then we'll turn around and see if she needs any help. And so as they got right up next to her, they realized she was not a little girl. She was a young teenager, but she was not a young, young child. And as they drove right past her, they would expect her to turn around and acknowledge the car creeping up on her, considering there's no other traffic in the area and you're just some person sitting on the side of the road. You should definitely turn around and see what's behind you. But the girl did not acknowledge them. She just continued to have her knees up to her chest and rocked back and forth. And so Misty and her mother are a little bit freaked out by this, but they drive past her about 50 meters. Misty's mother does a three-point turn. And when they're looking back down the road where the girl should now be on their left-hand side, they're oriented back towards their house now, she wasn't there anymore. But there were no street lights. It was now almost completely pitch dark outside. And so all they had was the headlights. And so Misty told her mom, you know, drive up a little ways. Maybe the girl stood up and moved and we just can't see her because she's not in the headlights. And so Misty's mom began driving down the road and kind of turning slightly towards the left to shine the light more to the left. 
but there was no sign of this girl. For good measure, they turned right slightly to shine the lights more to the right-hand side of the road, but there was no sign of this girl. And so Misty and her mother just slow rolled back down the road, kind of keeping their eye out on both sides. But after traveling for several minutes, going about five, 10 miles an hour and seeing no sign of this girl, they decided that, well, she must have just gone back into the woods and gone back to wherever it was she came from. And so Misty's mom began picking up speed and before long they had gone maybe two or three miles away from where they had seen this girl and they were coming up to this four-way intersection with stop signs all around. And as they were getting close, Misty's mother gasped because on the other side of the intersection, on the right-hand side, was this girl sitting on the side of the road. She's got her back to the road, her knees are up and she's rocking back and forth. And so Misty's mother pulls up the stop sign and then just sits there. And both women are just stunned at what they're looking at. They had just seen her two, three miles back down the road. It wasn't possible for her to get all the way up here. And so Misty's mother looks at her daughter and says, you know, do you think it's a different girl? And Misty's like, no, that's the same girl. And so they just sat there for a minute until Misty started to panic. And she said to her mom, mom, don't stop. I got, a, I got a bad feeling about this girl. I don't know what's going on, but you can't stop next to this girl. But Misty's mom, she was definitely weirded out by the situation, no doubt. But she didn't feel good about abandoning this girl in the middle of the night on the side of the highway. And so even though she felt a little bit hesitant herself, she told Misty, you know, we have to at least drive past her and ask if she's okay. That's, that's the least we can do. And Misty was not having it. She said, mom, do not stop. I got a bad feeling about this. Don't stop near this girl. But Misty's mom let up off the brake and began slow rolling past this intersection. And now at this point, Misty is just absolutely terrified. And so she takes her seatbelt off and she goes down into the footwell right in front of her seat. And she closes her eyes and covers her ears. And she just continues to beg her mother to just please keep going. Don't stop. But her mother just continues on until she stops right next to this girl who's still just sitting on the side of the road with her back to the road. She's got her knees up. She's rocking back and forth. She's not acknowledging Misty or her mother. And so Misty's mother turns to her daughter and says, please roll down your window. And Misty refuses. She's still down in the footwell, still in the fetal position. She's crying and she's still begging her mother to please just go home. And so Misty's mother, frustrated, reaches across the passenger seat and grabs the knob to roll down the window manually. So she rolls the window down and Misty, who's down in the footwell, all she remembers is sitting there covering up her ears and she's crying and she opens her eyes and she's looking up towards her mom who's reaching over the seat and her mom yells out to this girl. And Misty remembers looking at her mom who suddenly recoils in horror and screams and then they take off like crazy flying down the road. Misty jumps out of the footwell and she's looking at her mom and she's like, what's happening? What just happened? What did you see? And her mom's got her hand over her mouth and she's speeding down the road and she's crying now. And she's looking at Misty and she just doesn't have the words to describe what she just saw. And so Misty's asking her mom, what did you see? What happened? And finally her mother just said, she didn't have a face. She didn't have a face. It was, it was, it was hollow. There was nothing on her face when she looked at me. And so Misty screams and she's crying and her mom is crying and they speed home. They're home just a couple of minutes later and they run inside, practically falling over each other to get in the house. And as soon as they get inside, Misty's mom calls 911 and she didn't even know how to describe what she just saw, but she knew it was too embarrassing to try to describe it as some girl without a face sitting by the highway. And so she just told the police that they had seen a girl they think needs help. And so the police, they went out and they searched that entire stretch of highway. They looked for any sign of anybody out there, but there wasn't. There was never any trace of that girl. In 2016, a 25-year-old Wall Street banker named Matt was camping near Mount Rainier in Washington State. His job was so hectic that in the rare times he got a chance to, he would disappear into the wilderness for a few days to clear his head. Despite living in one of the biggest cities in the world, Matt was actually a very competent outdoorsman. And so for this trip, he decided he would stay way off any trail, deep in the back country in random locations. On the first night, he found a nice clearing in the trees, and so he set up his campsite there. He ate some food over his fire, he pitched his tent, climbed inside, and within a few minutes, he was fast asleep. Several hours later, Matt woke up to some strange sounds coming from outside of his tent. It sounded like a couple of animals, or maybe one animal, moving around right outside. 
And so after a while of just hearing this constant sound, he rolled over and he barely unzipped his tent flap just to look out and see if he could see whatever animal it was. And what he saw shocked him. There was a man sitting in front of his fire pit. There was no fire in his fire pit. And the guy was just sitting there with his hands on his knees, looking straight down. And periodically he would just kick his feet in the ashes of the fire pit. And Matt didn't even know what to do. So he's just looking at him through this little tiny gap in his tent. And this man all of a sudden looks up directly at Matt and makes eye contact with him. And the guy's eyes go wide and he stands up, turns around and runs away from Matt's campsite. Matt has no idea how to react to this. And so he just quickly unzips his tent, jumps outside and shines his light into the forest looking for this guy. He's thinking to himself, who is this guy? I am in the middle of nowhere in the back country of Washington state. How long was he sitting outside there for? What does he want? And so as Matt is trying to make sense of this totally weird thing, he's thinking, okay, I'm gonna look out and I'm gonna see his flashlight somewhere, or I'm gonna see his campsite. You know, maybe he's set up nearby and he's looking around into the total darkness. He's looking through all the trees, any light source anywhere out there he would see. And there's not one, there's no fire, there's no flashlight. There is nothing. And so eventually Matt goes back inside of his tent, he zips it up, and he's just left kind of dumbfounded. He can't understand how some person was just sitting outside of his tent for no apparent reason and then vanished into the forest without even turning on a flashlight. And so after a very restless night, finally the sun came up again and Matt was very relieved. He stepped outside. And after a little bit of time now from this strange incident, Matt started to tell himself that all that was is some guy happened to set up his campsite nearby. It is possible, albeit rare, because we're in the back country. And maybe he was just intoxicated and he wandered over here and, you know, stranger things have happened. So that's probably all it was. And so Matt felt like there was nothing to worry about. He packed up his campsite and he began hiking into the forest. Matt didn't have a planned route. Instead, he had a map and a compass and he began just kind of wandering in the forest, kind of exploring wherever he wanted to go. And over the next two days, he covered at least 10, maybe 15 miles in kind of random zigzag directions. He found a nice clearing and he set up another campsite. That night, he set up a fire and he was eating some food near his fire. And then as he's sitting there, he hears rustling coming from behind him. And he's pretty sure it's an animal. So he turns around and he doesn't see anything. And he goes back to eating his food. And then a little while later, he hears some more rustling behind him. And this time he can't really just write it off. Clearly there is something behind him that's moving around. And so he stood up, turned around and remained motionless and just listened, expecting to see maybe a deer come out of the woods. But instead he hears a man's voice come out of the darkness that says, do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? And Matt's heart starts racing. He knows that even though he can't see him, it has to be the same guy he saw two days ago because they are in the middle of nowhere. He hasn't seen any other hikers or campers or anyone. And clearly this guy has the ability to sneak up on him. And so he's thinking, what does this guy want? I just spent the past two days hiking in random directions for 15 miles and he must have followed me. And so Matt, not knowing what else to do, just says, I don't know where Bell's Canyon is. And then there's silence. And Matt, one part of him is thinking, I hope this guy does not come into the light. I hope he just goes away. The other part of him is thinking, well, you know, maybe this is a different person that is lost and they're looking for this place called Bell's Canyon and they'll come into the light. It'll be a big relief. I'll send them on their merry way and everything will be fine. But as Matt is having this wishful thinking, the voice from the shadows does not come any closer, but instead asks the same question a bit more forcefully this time. Do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? This time Matt did not respond. Now he was scared. This is not some friendly hiker looking for directions. There's something wrong. And so Matt, knowing he's all alone out here, he knew he had to do something to try to take control of this situation. And so he took a deep breath. He reached down and grabbed his flashlight light and in one swift motion he lifted his light up and shined it in the direction of this guy's voice and what he saw was this guy from two days ago looking out from behind a tree right in Matt's direction he was hiding from him and when the light hit him the man barked at Matt to aim it away and Matt kind of instinctively lowered his light, but now he was too scared to raise it again. And now he knows it's the same guy. This guy has been following me for two days. And so for several minutes, Matt just stood there absolutely terrified. And this guy, he just stayed out there. Matt didn't hear him move. It was just a complete standstill. And then the silence was broken yet again by this voice, except somehow he had moved even closer to Matt. 
and when he came through asking the same question, Do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? His voice was so close to Matt that Matt got scared and raised his light up, and the man was standing just a few feet away from him. And this time, the man's eyes got wide like they did the first time they saw Matt, and he turned around and he ran into the forest again. Matt, not knowing any better, just began running after him, but he only ran for about 30 seconds before he realized the terrain out here is so rough. He's gonna fall, get hurt, he's gonna get lost, and this guy's already long gone. He somehow managed to run immediately so far away. And so Matt just goes back to his campsite and he's thinking to himself, what do I do? I have no cell phone service. I'm at least three days away from my car and I'm in the middle of nowhere. No one even knows where I am because I didn't chart a course. I didn't tell anyone where I was gonna be. And so Matt just grabbed his knife and stood in the middle of the campsite and for hours and hours, he just kept looking around expecting this guy to just show up again or start speaking to him from somewhere out in the darkness. It was absolutely horrifying. Finally, by about three in the morning, Matt was so tired that he had to go to sleep. He hadn't heard this guy again. He didn't see him again. And he figured, I need a little bit of sleep because tomorrow he's gonna pack up his campsite and begin this epic journey back to his car. And so he climbed in his tent and he had a very restless next couple of hours. And the sun came up, Matt jumped out of his tent, packed up his stuff and began practically running in the direction of his car. All day as he was hiking, Matt kept looking over his shoulder, expecting to see this guy because clearly he had followed him for multiple days over 15 miles. And so the likelihood that he's still following him was really high. And so all day, Matt just felt like he was being watched. He was totally terrified. And then the sun started to go down and Matt knew he would have to camp out again. And so he found a clearing in the trees, he set up his campsite, and he was so tired from running basically all day and being so mentally exhausted from this experience that he just got in his tent and fell asleep very quickly. But several hours later, he woke up to the sound of somebody walking around his tent. And he knew it had to be this guy. He's still in the middle of nowhere. He's not even close to the parking lot yet. And so this guy is still following him. And so Matt sat up in his tent, he clutched his knife, and for hours and hours and hours, all night, this guy just walked around his campsite. And then around four or five in the morning, he scampered off. When the sun finally came up, Matt leapt out of his tent, packed up his stuff, and literally just began running in the direction of his car, hoping that maybe he could get there before needing to camp out one more night. And so all day as he moved, he's looking over his shoulder, knowing this guy is following him. At this point, it's not even a question. He's somewhere in the forest, but he could never see him. And unfortunately, as the sun was setting, he knew he was not gonna be able to make it to his car. He was just too far away. And so at some point when it got too dark to keep moving, he had to find a clearing and set up his tent again. And so once his tent was set up, he just climbed inside, grabbed his knife and sat there knowing this guy was somewhere out there. And so Matt climbed inside of his tent, he zipped it up behind him, he grabbed his knife and he sat there expecting to hear this guy come walking around. But after several hours, he didn't hear him. And Matt started to wonder, maybe this guy has left me alone, finally. Maybe he's not following me anymore. And so Matt, who was totally exhausted, laid down to go to sleep. And then as he's laying there from somewhere out in the woods, do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? Matt immediately sat up. His heart began racing so fast that he actually was concerned he might have a heart attack. And he didn't know what to do. He didn't know what to say. So he just sat there holding his knife. And then this guy began running past his campsite, making animal sounds. And he would stop periodically and moan and grunt and he'd kick up leaves. And then he'd run past his campsite again, over and over and over again until the sun finally came up and this guy scampered off back into the woods. Matt didn't waste any time. He leapt out of his tent, packed his stuff up, and ran all the way back to his car. When he finally got inside of his car, shut the door, and locked it, he cried tears of joy. He was so unbelievably relieved. And he peeled out of the parking lot. He got to a nearby hotel. He finally got cell phone reception. And he considered calling the police about this guy. But he thought, you know, what am I going to tell them? He didn't commit a crime. He was just terrifying. And so he decided not to call the police. He finally flew back to New York, and he just had to accept that there was some strange guy out in the wilderness of Washington state who was able to hunt him over three days and 30 miles in rugged terrain without the use of a flashlight, without any gear. And all he ever said to Matt was, do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? So that's going to do it guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it. So give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we will pin you at the top of the comments section.
If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please kidnap the like button, tie them up, and then forcibly brush their teeth and then make them drink orange juice. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three or four video uploads. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username is the same. It's johnballin416. I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. I also have a second YouTube channel called Mr. Ballin Shorts where I I post random short videos and lost episodes. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.